Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In September 2023 I visited the Giza Plateau for the very first time and on the first day of my tour I was lucky enough to enter the Sphinx enclosure. I walked all around the monument, taking a close look at the bedrock and masonry that makes up this iconic structure, and I also observed the eroded enclosure walls up close. I even watched sunrise from between the paws of the Great Sphinx, and it was a truly fascinating experience. Due to the height of the Sphinx's front paws, the area between them almost felt like a narrow corridor or room. It almost had its own atmosphere, totally separate from the rest of the enclosure. Interestingly, and what not many people know, is that this area between the paws used to be a kind of shrine, sanctuary or temple in its own right, and today it looks very different to how it looked when it was first uncovered by Giovanni Caviglia in the early 19th century. Yes, all we see today is a partly paved floor, renovated paws, the enormous granite dream stealer of Tutmos IV, and this strange granite plinth. In the modern era, this shrine or temple area has been stripped down to almost nothing, and there are so many lost relics scattered around the world in museum storerooms and basements. Most people don't even know they exist. Most visitors to the Great Sphinx don't know that this area between the paws was once decorated with an array of curious objects. Most people don't know that the famous Dream Stealer was actually one of three, and they have no idea what this plinth even is. And no, it's not ignorance, it's absolutely no fault of their own, because there is little information about it. So, as I often do on this channel, I've delved back through the history books, and in this video, I'll tell you exactly what was discovered between the paws of the Great Sphinx in the 19th century. I would love to locate the missing artefacts, to arrange museum visits, to photograph, film and document them, and then present them in a video for the next generation of ancient history researchers. So if anyone can help with that, please do get in touch. If you want to learn about what was discovered at Giza in the 19th century, the first port of call should always be the work of Howard Weiss. He led the excavations of 1837, working alongside Giovanni Caviglia and John Perring, and he produced three volumes of work, books that contain some fantastic sketches. It's inside the third volume of work where we learn about the excavations of the Sphinx, and you can read this book free of charge online at archive.org. I've left a link in the description below. Weiss quotes the papers of Henry Salt, who employed Giovanni Caviglia to excavate the Sphinx in 1818. When referring to the small temple area between the paws, he mentions the large granite dream stealer of Tutmos IV, but also two others made from limestone. When this area was excavated by Giovanni Caviglia, one of these stele was still in position and the other one had fallen down. And according to Salt, the one that had fallen was taken to the British Museum. Here is a sketch of one of the lost stele and we know that it was erected by Ramesses II of the 19th dynasty, as was the one directly opposite. Opposite the Dream Stealer and connected to the other sides of the Stele of Ramesses the Great are two small walls with an opening between them. In the middle of this opening on the floor was a statue of a lion, which Salt says was of good workmanship. It was facing the Dream Stealer and Salt believed it was found in its original position. We can see a fantastic sketch of the area I've just described, with the low walls, three stele and the lion on the floor. According to Salt, fragments of other lions rudely carved, as well as the head and shoulder of a sphinx were also found. All of these finds, together with the tablets, walls and floor, had also been found to be ornamented with red paint. Leaving this inner sanctuary and heading out towards the east, 
and you reach another pair of low walls, but the opening between them was raised two feet above the ground. It was like some sort of half window. This lion statue was found close to the walls, and it is thought to have sat on top of the northern wall looking out. The drawing looks a lot like a lion statue that was made during the reign of King Nectanebo I. He reigned between 380 and 343 BC, and so this may give us a rough indication of when this statue was made. I imagine there was also another matching lion that sat on the southern wall, and two more on the walls behind as per this diagram. Leaving this area and continuing east, and we next reach a granite altar, and part of this structure is still in situ today this plinth in this photograph, although today the upper parts are missing and they're apparently stored in the British Museum. Well, they were in the 19th century. Here is how the altar between the paws originally looked, and it's what is known as a horned altar. On it were found marks from fire, probably from burnt offerings. Horned altars from Egypt are not common, and they generally date to the later Hellenistic period. They're strongly associated with Greco-Roman solar cults, and we know the Sphinx was certainly a place of pilgrimage in Greco-Roman times. Here is another example of a horned altar from Hermopolis Magna, apparently the oldest example in Egypt, and it's from the temple tomb of Petosiris. This dates to between the end of the 4th and beginning of the 3rd century BC. It is believed that the horned altar had a solar function, and it was a religious object imported from the Near East. It wasn't native to Egypt. Fire consuming the offering on the altar may emphasise the battle between the sun god and his enemies, with the sun triumphant and renewing each morning on the eastern horizon, aka the sunrise. Here we can see another horned altar from Karnak, and this too was related to a solar cult. Having a horned altar at the Sphinx in later Egyptian history actually makes a lot of sense, because the Sphinx was certainly viewed as a solar monument, at least from the 18th dynasty onwards, and the fact that the small inner shrine, the associated artefacts and the Great Sphinx itself were all painted red, again shows the monument was related to solar worship. From the 18th dynasty onwards, the Sphinx was known by the name Horomachet, meaning Horus in the horizon, aka the rising or setting sun, a solar deity or sun god associated with a solar cult. Salt said he also found the figure of an owl, although I believe he means a hawk or a falcon, which was another symbol of Horomachet. He also found three small stones, and said that these were part of an altar. Votive offerings were also found between the paws. As well as the remains of this temple sanctuary, Cavilia also found fragments of the Sphinx's beard, as shown in these diagrams and some parts of the beard are still on display in the British Museum. The missing snake's head from the Sphinx Nemes headdress was also discovered, and there were various Greek and Roman inscribed items, including platforms, masonry fragments and stone tablets. One tablet specifically says that here was where they worshipped the sun, also known as Harmachis, another name for Horomachet and it calls this god the overseer and saviour. There was also once a large Roman staircase in front of the Sphinx, and this was built over the Old Kingdom Sphinx Temple. This small stone platform was built at the end of the first staircase, and it is thought to have been some kind of station where Roman emperors and people of distinction could witness the religious ceremonies that took place between the paws. Another staircase was discovered beyond this, and then this small structure was also uncovered, and an inscription says it was erected under the Emperor Septimius Severus, who served as Roman Emperor between 193 and 211 AD. At this location, a stela was found with inscriptions from the reigns of Mark Antony and Lucius Verus. There was also another inscription from the reign of Emperor Nero. 
all of this shows just how important the Sphinx must have been in Roman times. The Sphinx we see today has been reconstructed and it is now well preserved. But since the excavations in the 19th century, so much has been removed and so much is now probably lost in old museum storerooms. I particularly love this sketch by Henry Salt, who has drawn the Sphinx as it would have once looked, with the sanctuary between the paws intact. The sad thing is, this sanctuary could have been left alone, but instead it's been torn down, and so a big part of the Sphinx history is now lost forever. It's also worth mentioning this area behind the Dream Stealer. Salt called it a small temple, 10 feet long and 5 feet wide, and this is where the snake's head and also fragments of the beard were discovered. Salt says that according to Pliny, this was the final resting place of Amasis, the first king of the 18th dynasty, aka Armos I. Here we can see how the area looks today, and we can see the remains of the rectangular indentation, as per the drawing by Henry Salt. The claims by Pliny cannot be corroborated, but interestingly, the tomb of Armos I has never been positively located. Maybe this king, the father of the 18th dynasty, the one that ended the Hyksos reign in northern Egypt, was reinterred below the head of the Sphinx after the sand was removed by Tutmos IV. The court of the Sphinx, aka Horomachet, was massively important to the kings of the 18th dynasty, and I believe its meaning was deeper than any of us realise. Each and every 18th dynasty pharaoh had a connection to the Great Sphinx, and all of them had their own Sphinx monuments created in stone. So, wouldn't it be amazing if Pliny was right, that the legend is indeed correct, that Ormos I was laid to rest at the Sphinx, and what better place than directly below the head of the Great Monument, and just behind the famous Dream Stealer. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.